breaking tonight. What has Robert Mueller found? The special counsel's Russia investigation is finished. Now Washington and the world await its findings. The American people have a right to the truth. What it could mean for Trump, his presidency, and his country. A long-awaited sentence in the humble bus crash. It's not going to change that my son's not here. Susan Ormiston will take us to a community still coming to terms with tragedy. And bracing for more details. Uh, I don't know the motivations. Jody Wilson-Raybould will release emails, texts, and a written statement. The latest on a controversy the Trudeau government just can't seem to shape. This is The National. For many Americans, this U.S. presidency has been defined by personality. And for nearly two years now, two vastly different personalities have dominated the political landscape and the drama. On one hand, Donald Trump, vocal, brazen, certain that his win in 2016 was untarnished. On the other, Robert Mueller, publicly silent, rarely seen, tasked with learning if that presidential victory was tainted by campaign collusion with Russia. Now his investigation is done, and tonight we'll tackle the questions the Mueller report may answer, including whether there was a crime or a cover-up. Donald Trump has called it a witch hunt, a politically motivated hit job. But as Paul Hunter explains, if Mueller has delivered a bombshell, it hasn't exploded yet. It's done. Finally. Robert Mueller, the special counsel whose work has been hanging over the presidency of Donald Trump almost the whole time he's been in office is finished. The question now, what has he concluded? Late today, Mueller delivered his report, described as comprehensive to this man, Bill Barr, U.S. Attorney General. It's up to Barr to now decide how much of it to make public as Americans await answers to two key questions. Did the Donald Trump campaign collude with Russia to interfere in the 2016 election? And has Donald Trump obstructed justice much. by in any way impeding the work of Mueller? Barr, in a written statement tonight to senior lawmakers on Capitol Hill, pledged transparency. I am reviewing the report and anticipate that I may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. Indeed, for the moment, not even the White House has seen Mueller's findings. We look forward to the process taking its course, said Trump's press secretary tonight. Earlier, Trump echoed his view of the whole thing. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Everybody knows it. It's all a big hoax. It's, I call it the witch hunt. Tonight, Democrats demanded they see the report before Trump and have pledged to fight Barr if he holds back any of it. It's imperative for Mr. Barr to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Even as Barr studies the report, there are clues to where Mueller's gone. Multiple sources tonight say there will be no more indictments. That means none for any in Trump's family, not Donald Trump Jr., not Jared Kushner, as some had speculated there might be. And of course, that means none for Trump himself, though some have suggested even if Mueller found cause to indict Trump, he might choose not to indict a sitting president. Worth noting, also in Barr's letter, a clear suggestion whatever Mueller asked for, he got. Barr writes he'd be forced to say so if any request by Mueller was rebuffed, but, says Barr, there were no such instances during the special counsel's investigation. And, Paul, what does the White House say should happen with the Mueller report? Well, look, Trump himself said this week, let people see it. But the short answer is it 100 percent depends on what Mueller's got. After all, we don't yet know a single specific thing that's in it. There are reports. The White House is already looking at claiming executive privilege on some of it, keeping some parts private. For example, if the report suggests in the end that Trump may indeed have obstructed justice, remember, Mueller may not be indicting Trump strictly because Trump is a sitting president. That doesn't mean there isn't evidence of wrongdoing. So if there is evidence of that in Mueller's report, certainly the White House won't want it out there. But again, lawmakers from both parties have said they want the whole thing public. And indeed, Democrats will certainly fight to make it so. That battle 
and drama may be just beginning. Thank you, Paul. And Rosemary, this may be the final report, but Mueller has already made some of his findings public. Yeah, that's right, Ian, through those indictments that Paul talked about, court filings. Mueller's already sketched in some intimate detail Russia's plot to help Trump win the 2016 election. Those included using hacked emails and a massive clandestine influence campaign over social media. So will this report add anything that could actually change the story in some substantive way in Washington. We reached out to Garrett Graff, an author and journalist who wrote a book about Robert Mueller's FBI and has followed this story at every turn. I think there are three things that we could see in this report that could actually move Republican opinion substantially in the course of uh, a, a, as it becomes public. First is presidential involvement in a specific crime related to the 2016 campaign. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. For instance, attempting to coordinate with Russia to release hacked emails at a key moment to inflict maximum damage on Trump's opponent. Second is a pattern of obstruction of justice, something where Mueller was able to paint a picture uh, of, uh, you know, months or even years long pattern of activities that make clear that the president's motive was to obstruct justice. For example, if Trump fired his FBI director for less than wholesome reasons. Regardless of recommendation, I was going to fire Comey. And in fact, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. The third is sort of the counterintelligence question, which is, does Mueller have any evidence that uh, Donald Trump at any point conspired with a foreign power or took actions to advance a foreign power's interests at the expense of the United States? Some say Trump's pursuit of real estate deals in Moscow to his persistent agreement with the Kremlin on matters like election meddling suggest just that. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. Or these could be runaway suspicions without substance. One of the things that, that we lose sight of is that the best case for the United States is that this was all a series of weird coincidences and misunderstandings. He has already shown that even if there was no conspiracy, there was no collusion with Russia, that Donald Trump led the most criminal presidential campaign in American history. That, this, uh, that it was a, a stunning gathering of criminality on uh, uh, of greed uh, at a scale almost unimaginable and without peer in the history of American politics. Okay, to dig into what we know now and what might happen next, more crucially, we're joined by Andrew Cohen. He's a law professor at the University of Arizona, author of the book Prosecuting the President, How Special Prosecutors Hold Presidents Accountable and Protect the Rule of Law, so he knows what he's talking about, and Keith Bogue, the CBC's Washington correspondent, who's done extensive coverage of the Mueller investigation. Good to see you both, gentlemen. Andrew, I'm going to start with you. How much do you think Barr will actually reveal to Congress and to the public? All he is committed to revealing so far in the letter that he sent to Congress today is the special prosecutor's principal conclusions, uh, which could be quite limited uh, indeed. Now, he's offered to release those principal conclusions uh, as early as this weekend, so there's some suggestion that that won't be the end of what he reveals to Congress. But we really don't know what he will decide to release. Uh, and in some significant sense, we're operating in uncharted territory here because Robert Mueller's investigation is the first special prosecution uh, or special prosecutor investigation in American history conducted under the current regulations, the first significant investigation conducted under those current regulations. Uh, and so there really aren't a lot of guideposts here from past history. Okay, so let me let me turn to you then, Keith, and ask you the more political question related to that. No matter what Barr releases, will that be adequate for Congress? 
Oh, it won't be adequate for Congress, and I think maybe it might be even more important whether it's it's adequate for the public in general. I mean, look how much attention has been paid to this investigation over the last nearly two years. And the idea that somehow we would just get a little synopsis of what the broad conclusions are and that would be publicly acceptable, I think, I think borders on the absurd. I think it has to be done in a way that not only uh, appears to be transparent, but uh, is in fact transparent. And of course, everything changed with midterm elections. Uh, when Democrats took control of the House, they have subpoena power now. There's a lot that they can do. If the, if the White House wants to have a fight uh, over how much of this to release, I think Democrats will say, bring it on. Andrew Cohen, back to you. Officials have, have said, as Paul reported there, that there will be no further indictment. Does that, do you interpret that to mean, though, that there is no other possibility of a criminal investigation that needs to be investigated? I don't interpret it that way. I think that it's already clear that Robert Mueller has spun off uh, several criminal investigations yes. to uh, other uh, prosecutors uh, around the country, ordinary federal prosecutors, mm -hmm. not special prosecutors, and that there are many uh, current investigations ongoing that pertain directly or indirectly to uh, the president, most notably uh, the ones being conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of uh, New York. We don't know what else Mueller might be spinning off uh, as he winds down uh, his investigation, uh, but it does seem uh, pretty clear uh, that uh, at this stage, uh, the special prosecutor will not himself be recommending uh, any indictments, that it will be up to other prosecutors uh, at this stage uh, if there are going to be further indictments coming down. And would that, Keith, then be uh, an enormous amount of relief for the president? Would he, would he already think that that is a victory tonight, hearing that news? Well, he might think so tonight. He might not think so in 48 hours. It really <laughs> depends upon what, uh, what, what, the, uh, what, what the Mueller report says about his behavior. Because remember, uh, we had an example in the Michael Cohen plea deal where the president was not named but was uh, indicated as individual one, uh, mm -hmm. someone who was an unindicted co-conspirator, if I may put it that way. It's quite possible that the Mueller report, uh, Mueller will not ch uh, indict the president because he is a sitting president, as Paul said in his piece, uh, but that he will outline a series of events or a type of behavior that would unquestionably be uh, criminal behavior if it were done by any other person. And we know this because he's done it before. So I think that they're, you know, until they They've been through the whole document themselves. Um, I don't think it's a good time for them, you know, to be thinking about good night's sleep, so to speak. Andrew, what do you think is likely to happen next? I mean, obviously, we'll get these principal conclusions. There'll likely be a, a fight in the courts about how much more should be released. But what is likely to happen after this? There will be a fight if uh, Attorney General Barr decides to disclose anything less than uh, the full report. But at this stage, we don't know what he's going to choose uh, to disclose. We don't know uh, which tools uh, Congress uh, is going to deploy in an attempt to um, pry the, any undisclosed portions of the report uh, out of the Attorney General's hands. But I think one thing is very clear. Uh, whatever the report says, uh, the fact that Robert Mueller has been able to complete this investigation is in and of itself a victory for the rule of law in the United States uh, and a victory for American uh, institutions, but it's a victory that has been attained uh, despite the president's best efforts to shut down the investigation, despite the president's best efforts to subvert the rule of law and to turn the Justice Department into his personal plaything. Uh, and that is a cause uh, for grave concern going forward. And whether the president is held accountable uh, for those actions, either by Congress uh, or uh, the American people in the 2020 presidential elections remains to be seen. If he is not, that is a very bad sign for the future of American democracy. Okay, Andrew Cohen, Keith Bogue, thank you both for your perspectives. Appreciate it tonight. We'll run a little bit of Keith's uh, documentary on the Mueller investigation later in the show. But to get a sense of just how much of a developing this story this is, there are reports citing U.S. justice officials that say Attorney General William Barr was at this Justice Department just this evening, still making his own way through the Mueller report. It promises to be a busy weekend, to say the least, and you can bet that that pressure on him uh, is going to continue for the public to see just what is in the pages he's reading.
Later in the hour, as I said, we will have that in-depth look that Keith did on what we know about Mueller's investigation so far. But first to Andrew and what was a very emotional day in Saskatchewan, Andrew. Yeah, Rosie, it's been nearly a year since that deadly humbled Broncos bus crash. But today, the families of the victims learned what price the accused will pay. For taking 16 lives, forever changing 13 more, and shattering countless others, the driver of the truck that ca caused the crash was handed eight years in prison, doing time for each of the victims all at once, not back to back. The decision, unprecedented, because this case was unprecedented. A hugely emotional one for the victims' families. Susan Ormiston was there. Jaskarat Singh Sidhu's sentence is the stiffest ever for dangerous driving causing death with no impairment. Eight years for each Bronco killed and five years for each injured served concurrently. But does that feel like justice? Well, that's more complicated. I know it was high number of years precedent setting in the eyes of the justice system, but for killing my son, no. The Heralds lost their young son, Adam. When you take it into perspective, if you don't even take into consideration the injured people, it's six months per, per life. We, we have a lifetime sentence of you know, pain, suffering, and, and you know, mental anguish. The Boulay's son, Logan, died in hospital. It's not going to change that my son's not here or that 15 other family members are not here. On April 6th, a clear day, Sidhu drove past four signs indicating an intersection up ahead, never ever touching the brakes even at a large stop sign. Judge Cardinal said it is baffling and incomprehensible that a professional driver could miss so many markers over such a long distance. His inattention displays risky behavior. Sidhu was a brand new semi-driver at the wheel of a double trailer weighing 45,000 kilos and he's never fully explained why he didn't break. I hope that Mr. Sidhu uh, thinks about what has happened and I hope it's a message to the trucking industry that it's not okay to wheel those big weights down the highways and uh, for disregard for the laws of the road. Sidhu's family throughout this court hearing has listened and wept and today an uncle spoke for them. I would like to express my sincere sympathy to the 29 families. We also feel indebted to the families and the Canadian public at large. It's now nearly a year since the Broncos crash and that date April 6th is already weighing heavily on Marilyn Cross who lost a son. How are you feeling about the anniversary coming up? Oh, I'm kind of... That's okay. It's okay. You know what? You don't have to answer any more questions, okay? The Broncos are planning a permanent memorial here and a gathering in Humboldt. The parents are relieved that this painful legal process is over for now. Sadu is in a correctional facility here in Saskatchewan tonight. After the appeal window closes about a month, he'll be transferred to a federal penitentiary, Andrew. And Susan, in your piece, we heard this sentence sets a precedent. What did the judge say about that? Yeah, she sent a very strong message. She said, quote, the carnage on the roads has to stop and it shouldn't have taken an event like this to show people that driving a motor vehicle requires their full attention. Okay, Susan Ormiston, thanks very much. Now, important to note, Sidhu's eight-year prison sentence doesn't necessarily mean he'll spend eight years in prison. In Canada, most offenders who receive less than a life sentence are eligible for full-day parole after serving a third of their time. That decision is up to the Parole Board of Canada. And further, except in very specific cases, even when day parole is declined, inmates typically get statutory release after serving two-thirds of their sentence. So it is possible that of his eight-year sentence, Sidhu might actually spend approximately, give or take a few months, three to five years behind bars. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight, starting in Montreal, where a live broadcast captured the disturbing moments of an attack at a landmark church. It was obvious what his intentions were, so I left screaming to alert the security. 
The suspect was in St. Joseph's Oratory and appeared to be taking part in the Mass. You can see him approach the altar as the priest is conducting the service. He slashed the priest with what police are calling a sharp object. The man was subdued by security staff. The priest is listed in stable condition and is expected to make a full recovery. The police aren't saying much about the attack other than the suspect has a criminal record and is expected to be charged tomorrow. In my view, this is directly related uh, to uh, the pressure uh, that they have put so far on the Kenyan government to release Mrs. Wang. Canada's former ambassador to China reacting to news that Canadian canola is no longer welcome in the country, but some are calling more retaliation by China for the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. About 40% of Canada's canola seed exports went to China last year, worth close to $3 billion. Still ahead on The National, another twist in the SNC-Lavalin controversy, what a former attorney general says she will now bring to the table. And as we wait for more details on Mueller's report, we go in-depth and break down just how we got to this point. And later, a week after the shootings in Christchurch, how communities of different faiths are coming together to send a message of peace. When you look around in the faces in this cold weather, something rises from here that is so incredibly positive and celebratory. At the end of a long, hard week, Justin Trudeau was fielding, you know, some pretty friendly questions tonight. This public town hall meeting in Thunder Bay was a walk in the park compared to what he's been facing these days in Ottawa. But it's bound to be a very brief respite from some hardball politics. As the CBC's David Cochran tells us, the Prime Minister's biggest challenge may be about to get fresh fuel. The herd hat is probably a good idea, as the Prime Minister faces continued attacks over SNC-Lavalin from the outside and the inside. There has been a full airing at the Justice Committee of the matters involving the former Justice Minister and Attorney General. He clearly wants to move on, but each time he tries to change the channel, others turn up the volume. The latest, a letter from Jody Wilson-Raybould telling the Justice Committee she has relevant facts and evidence in her possession and will be providing a written submission to the committee. Are they trying to take down your boss? Uh, I don't know the motivations um, behind, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould and uh, Jane Philpott are doing. Wilson Raybould will provide written testimony because the Liberals blocked attempts to have her testify a second time. She, along with Jane Philpott, also claim they can't speak freely because of cabinet confidentiality, something their fellow Liberals say isn't true. If they want to, to tell their story, they have the best seat in the House in this country to do so. Parliamentary privilege allows them to tell their truth. This is a smokescreen. At the end of the day, the person who is incumbent on to be able to waive full privilege is the Prime Minister. She testified for four hours on her experiences as Justice Minister in regards to Lavalin. There has been an airing of that for five weeks in front of the uh, ethics, uh, the, uh, the Justice Committee. The Liberals took deliberate steps this week to move past SNC. The clerk of the Privy Council retired. They shut down the committee hearings. The finance minister tabled his budget. But their own MPs took deliberate steps to keep it alive. Selena Caesar Chavan quit the caucus. Philpot gave an explosive interview to McLean's. And now Wilson Raybould will add to her truth in written form, ensuring at least one more chapter in this story. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, David mentioned that both former ministers have raised this issue of cabinet confidentiality, rightly or wrongly, to explain why they feel they are limited in what they can say. I, Jane Philpott, do swear that I will be faithful and to bear... Both ministers have sworn oaths that read in part, I shall keep secret all matters committed and revealed to me in this capacity. They also swear to speak honestly in those closed cabinet meetings. That's the whole point. Ministers must be free to disagree in private and find a consensus, then emerge to present a united front and retain the confidence of the House. It's considered a cornerstone of our British parliamentary system, and anyone who breaks that confidence could face a criminal charge 
breach of trust. Still ahead on The National, getting help to Mozambique days after the devastating cyclone. Our team on the ground explains the challenges. But first, with Mueller's report now complete, we break down the 22-month investigation and how Donald Trump reacted through it all. Isn't he behaving like a guilty person? In that case, yes. I think that's exactly how the president is acting. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. Now back to our top story and the document that everyone in Washington has been waiting for. Robert Mueller has finally submitted his report on Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Now, with Mueller's work having already secured dozens of indictments and many guilty pleas, we asked our Keith Bogue for a look at the big picture so far, starting with an ominous message sent from the FBI to the Democrats more than three years ago. Kensington Wine Rooms in London's Mayfair has a small and accidental part in the story of Donald Trump's presidency. It was here that George Papadopoulos, a young foreign policy advisor to Trump's 2016 presidential campaign, met for drinks with the Australian High Commissioner Alexander Downer. In a rambling conversation, his tongue loosened by alcohol, Papadopoulos casually tells Downer something stunning, that Russia has damaging information on presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and plans to release it in the final stage of the election campaign. And this is the, the first indication that anybody connected with the campaign has knowledge. Has of knowledge of emails that the Russians may have gathered. Now. Michael Isakoff is co-author of Russian Roulette, a book that brings some order and insight to the many twisted threads of what we call the Russia investigation. Papadopoulos has a minor but crucial role in that story. He's important because it was the information about Papadopoulos that did trigger the FBI investigation. That doesn't happen until months later, but it's an important clue about whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. So I think when people talk about collusion sort of colloquially, what we as lawyers would usually call that is conspiracy. Barrett Berger is a former federal prosecutor who now directs the Center for Advancement of Public Integrity at Columbia Law School. Under the you know, federal law, a conspiracy is just an agreement between two people to do something illegal. So it doesn't have to be something that's in writing. It doesn't have to be something where both parties are you know, making money out of this agreement. It's just the agreement itself. A meeting here at Trump Tower and whether it constitutes collusion is one of the central elements in the Russia story. That day, senior members of the Trump campaign, Donald Trump Jr., his brother-in-law Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort, met with Russian emissaries, including Kremlin-connected lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya. Trump Jr.'s emails before the meeting show he hoped to get dirt on Hillary Clinton from the Russians. He's told by his contact that Veselnitskaya is offering official documents about Clinton that are high-level and sensitive information that is part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. Donald Jr. replies, if it's what you say, I love it. The meeting is kept secret for more than a year, but when news of it breaks, the first explanation from President Trump and his son is untruthful. Eventually, both the Russians and the Trump campaign say the meeting was a bust that led nowhere. But at the very least, it's strange that it happened at all. The first big deal about it is that they took the meeting in the first place, given the email trail that clearly said this was about getting damaging information from Kremlin files that could be used by the Trump campaign, um, and that it was part of a Russian government effort to help elect Donald Trump. 
At about this time, ex-British spy Christopher Steele enters the story. He's contracted by the Clinton campaign to look for dirt on Trump. His report becomes known as the Steele dossier, and when it falls into the hands of reporters, they find it red hot. Do you remember your first impressions? Um, wow, if this is true, <laughs> this is huge. Um, but, you know, my first reading of it was as a journalist. What could I corroborate? The Steele dossier is a series of memos based on raw intelligence. Its main point is that Russia has for years been cultivating Trump as an asset and has compiled compromising information on him. Steele seems to have quickly found some of what U.S. intelligence discovered only later. You have this document that makes all sorts of interesting allegations. In a way, it would be foolish not to try to chase down some of those allegations to try to figure out if they are true or not true. Um, because if, they, if many of them are true, they're, they're very significant. Some elements in broad strokes um, uh, do seem to have panned out. Certainly the fact that um, uh, Trump was trying to do business in Russia uh, over multiple years and that that was continuing um, and that, you know, has emerged as, you know, a very central part of the story. Trump's ongoing efforts to build a Trump Tower in Moscow contradict his public statements. I have nothing to do with Russia, folks, okay? I'll give you a written statement, nothing to do. But they tie me into Russia. He denied it, even as his lawyer, Michael Cohen, was representing him in talks with Russia about the development. Cohen has been sentenced to three years in prison for tax evasion, fraud, and for lying to Congress about the Trump Tower deal. Trump campaign members have already had numerous contacts with Russians before their national convention in Cleveland, including Trump's future national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Michael Isakoff asks Flynn about a speech at a Moscow gathering organized by Russian state television, and Flynn gets prickly. Were you paid for that event? I, you'd have to ask my uh, the folks that, that uh, went over there to... to uh, well, I'm asking you. you. You'd know if you were paid. Yeah, I mean, I, I went over there as a speaking event. It was a speaking event. And what you, difference does that make? Well, I mean, I mean, somebody go, oh, he's paid by the Russians. Well, Donald Trump has made a lot of the, the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton has taken money from Wall Street. Yeah, I didn't take Sachs. any money from Russia, if, you, if that's what you're asking me. Well, then who paid you? Uh, my, my speakers bureau. Ask them. Russian state television paid Flynn more than $45,000 for his speech. And I thought it was a great opportunity. And we will make America great again. By the time of the convention, Trump's team has already rewritten the party's foreign policy platform to make it more sympathetic to Russia in its conflict with Ukraine. The day after Republicans wrap up, the web-based publisher of Other People's Secrets, WikiLeaks, strikes. The Democrats are dealing with a brand new little email mess. Is Russia meddling with the U.S. presidential election? Hillary At their nominating convention in Philadelphia, Democrats are outwardly celebrating. But behind the scenes, they are reeling from the emails that reveal embarrassing and damaging private information about the candidate, Clinton, and how the officially neutral DNC had secretly backed her nomination over populist Senator Bernie Sanders. And if it is Russia... Is Bizarrely, later that week, Clinton's opponent weighed in from his golf club in Florida, encouraging Russia to hack and steal even more information from Clinton. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. <laughs> The WikiLeaks email dump and Trump's strange appeal to Russia prompt the Australian government to finally contact the FBI about that meeting at the Kensington Wine Rooms with George Papadopoulos. Those things, together with what they already know of others in Trump's circle, persuade the FBI to open an investigation into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia. They had these strands. They knew about Manafort for some time. That's Paul Manafort. Formerly a political fixer for ousted Ukrainian president and Russian ally, Viktor Yanukovych. Manafort was also millions of dollars in debt to a Russian oligarch and friend of Vladimir Putin, 
Oleg Deripaska. They knew about Carter Page uh, for some time. He was on their radar screen. Carter Page, part of Trump's campaign foreign policy team, also with connections to Russia through the oil and gas industry. U.S. intelligence suspected Russia was cultivating Page and had been watching him since at least 2014. The FBI investigation into the Trump campaign is fully underway before Election Day, but it's kept secret. Few in the FBI expect Trump will soon become president. The, the president, president of the, of the United, United States. States! One of the most curious parts of the Trump-Russia story is the behavior of Trump as president. He casts doubt on U.S. intelligence conclusions that Russia interfered with the election. Wow, what a move by President Trump. And it's a grotesque abuse of power by the President of the United States. In May 2017, he fires James Comey, the director of the FBI, and the next day welcomes Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak into the Oval Office. He brags to them that he's got rid of Comey. He was crazy, a real nut job, Trump said, according to the White House notes on the meeting. I faced great pressure because of Russia. That's taken off. After that, the FBI reportedly broadened its counterintelligence investigation to include the president himself to see whether he was secretly or unwittingly acting on behalf of Russia. And last year in Helsinki, after a two-hour private meeting with Vladimir Putin and no aides or advisors, Trump refused to endorse the conclusion of U.S. intelligence that Russia had meddled in the 2016 election. Why? Because Putin denied it. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. The next day, he tried to walk that back. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. Sort of a double negative. On Twitter, Trump has repeatedly called the Russia investigation a witch hunt. Those words appear in more than 150 tweets and still counting. Isn't he behaving like a guilty person? In that case, yes. I think that's exactly how the president is acting. I mean, his, his tactics of, you know, really repeatedly criticizing both the investigation itself and, you know, the people involved in it specifically are, you know, sort of textbook of what, you know, a defendant does if you can't challenge the facts. So to that extent, yes, I think that, you know, strikes me as something that a guilty person would do. Why? I mean, the, the most logical explanation is that the Russians have something on Trump. And my only hesitation about endorsing that is that nothing about Donald Trump's presidency is logical. Whatever the relationship between the Trump campaign and Russia, we know this. The president, his son, his campaign manager, his longtime friend and lawyer, and his former national security advisor, among others, have all been untruthful when asked about the campaign's contacts with Russia. And at least some of them have gone to jail for that. At the Kensington Wine Rooms, a plaque reminds patrons they're not just out for an evening, they're whining and dining on the edge of history. Keep Bogue, CBC News, Washington. Up next on The National, assessing the damage in Mozambique and why the situation may get worse. To reach communities is 30 kilometers of water. So to reach those vulnerable uh, communities, the challenge is you can't take boats. You can't just take a barge in here and stuff. They're going to get stuck. The images coming out of Mozambique are as shocking as they are utterly heartbreaking. It's been eight days since Cyclone Idai ripped through the central coast, and people there are still stranded, still hungry, still wet, still waiting for help to arrive. Aid organizations and rescue crews are working frantically to reach those most in need, a need growing more dire by the day. More than 1.7 million people were affected by the storm in Mozambique. Malawi and Zimbabwe were hit hard too. Both are dealing with their own devastation. 
Edai made landfall near Beira, a port city of about half a million people. 90% of the area was destroyed. An estimated 400,000 people there and in surrounding areas have been left homeless. Many have lost everything. About 65,000 people have been plucked from rooftops and trees and taken to temporary evacuation centers like this one at a secondary school. Others are in makeshift shelters like this at the side of a rural road. And there are so many still out there, still stranded, at least 15,000 according to one government official. And for them, time is running out. The CBC's Nala Ayad has just arrived in Mozambique and she's at the airport in Barra tonight. She has the latest on the rescue and relief efforts. It is really hard to appreciate the enormity of the disaster that has affected this place until you see it with your very own eyes. And we did that today. From the air as we were landing in the city of Beira, it was clear that the sea that has so disrupted lives here is simply vast. Now, I've been texting with people who live here and who lived through what has befallen the city, and they're telling me that they have a shortage of everything. For one, there is no electricity here, and there's no prospect of that being restored anytime soon. Uh, food shortages are there, and many people, thousands of people, don't even have the basic comfort of sleeping with a roof over their heads. One woman told me that they're desperate to get water purification tablets because there have already been cases of cholera being reported. Others are saying that while food aid is coming in, it's not happening quick enough. The first day we received help, but they didn't give it to everyone, she says. They only gave it to those who got inside, but those outside received nothing. Now that is where this airport comes in. There are dozens and dozens of people coming from right across the world who are here to lend a hand. And what we're hearing is that despite the fact that there were still some dramatic rescues today, they are trying to shift the focus now from search and rescue operations and more to actually addressing some of those needs that I mentioned to you earlier today. And their fundamental challenge, the biggest problem they have in delivering that aid is obviously transport. We saw from the air some of those roads that have been washed out. Virtually every road in this area has been affected in some way. It looks like a giant sea or a lake in the middle of a city. And so that is one of the biggest challenges. How do you get food and medicine to people who desperately need it and some of whom who literally haven't been able to eat for a week? In the meantime, earlier today it was raining, but we're told that the waters here are receding, which should help eventually. But it also brings a double dose of bad news. One is that some of those bodies that are being exposed as the water recedes could increase the risk of disease here. And the other thing, of course, is that the death toll will almost certainly rise. Nalayed, CBC News at the Beira Airport, Mozambique. And our moment is coming up. In New Zealand today, there was a remarkable show of solidarity with Muslims. But first, here's what happened in Toronto. People from a variety of faiths met at mosques across the city ahead of Friday prayers to show their support for the Muslim community after the shootings a week ago in Christchurch. Our heart and our beings are just broken as a result of this. But there is also, when you look around at the faces in this cold weather, something rises from here that is so incredibly positive and celebratory and sustaining that no matter the of evil that exists in this world, it will not prevail. It will not prevail. One week ago in Christchurch, New Zealand, there was shooting and screaming and sobbing. And today, to mark this anniversary, there was silence and solidarity. Regardless of religion, people gathered to pray in mosques, cathedrals, school fields, park universities, and youth centers. At 1.40 in the afternoon, the nation observed two minutes of silence, marking the moment the attack on the two mosques began just a week earlier. 50 people, remember, were killed in that attack. 
And the gestures of support didn't stop there. All over the country, women wore headscarves as a sign of unity. That movement with the hashtag Headscarf for Harmony is our moment. Being from Christchurch, where the recent terror attacks um, occurred, um, it was it sort of hit everybody quite personally. A large group of New Zealand women wanted to show some support and solidarity that they're not alone. So it's really just about coming together in, in, in a peaceful way to show support. I've just been so blown away with how this community has just like band together and been like, nope, this isn't going to be a thing that drives in fear. I'm nobody, but I am somebody in this country. And I think um, as a non-Muslim, it's important for me to be able to show my support. It's so lovely to see women just posting these beautiful photos of them in their headscarves. And it's almost like giving power to the women who do choose to wear their um, scarf. It's a privilege that we get to carry each other. Such a small but powerful gesture and so widely embraced. We know the Prime Minister was wearing one of the headscarves. So were female staff on Air New Zealand. So, in fact, were uh, women on the air on television uh, in that country as well in a sense of how, not just how deeply felt the, the massacre was, but also the support across the country for the victims. Yeah, well, support across the country, but also well beyond the country too, right? I mean, of the thousands of posts that you could find using that hashtag online, there were, of course, many from New Zealand, Australia as well, uh, but Turkey, Poland, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Germany, the UK, the US, Canada, the list sort of goes on and on and on. And, and you talked about the number of posts. There were something like four and a half thousand on Facebook, another 3,000 on Instagram. So people not only doing it, but wanting to show New Zealand that they were doing it and they were thinking of them. That's the National for March 22nd tonight. tonight. tonight.